that the um, Avian uh, advertisers are really happy about that. I know this is not coming to you sponsored by, by bottled water. However, I think that that clearly exemplifies a huge conundrum that we are faced with in higher education, and that is we have a technology and we think we should use it. Um, the bane of, of kind of my existence is uh, you, you know, people who come and say, I, I've heard about this great new technology and I want to use it to teach. And I said, so why? Well, I don't know. Have you used the technology? No, but everybody else is using it, so perhaps I should use it. So that was kind of the context, right? Technology has enabled us to do all kinds of things, but I'm not exactly sure that we should just be using it because of that purpose. So today what I'm going to talk to you about is, um, is classroom without walls. And what that really means, it's not working, <laughs> is we're going to be talking about teaching and learning in an age of digital distraction and disorder. And I'm going to start out with a tale of, of two classrooms. So as Patrick mentioned, I, I teach in the faculty development program at Seneca College. Oh, because oh, I have it upside down. Exactly what he told me I was going to do. Okay, this is really going as it should. <laughs> so this, this is actually the classroom that I, I teach in during the day, right? It's the typical uh, college university classroom. It's, it's kind of gray. That's exactly what it looks like, even with all the lights on. As you notice, there's an a, um, overhead projector in the back of the room because some people uh, you know, still use that. So I have 25 students in, in the two faculty development courses. We have a very structured faculty development program. There are three subjects that all probationary faculty uh, have to take as part of their probationary requirement, which is kind of, you know, at the colleges we do it a little bit different than the universities. And they all live within a 100-mile radius of Toronto. And then I would travel down the Don Valley Parkway, and I would enter E.T. MOOC. And E.T. MOOC. <coughs> <clears throat> was uh, in, in ET MOOC there were 200, 2,000 participants and uh, they were from 70 countries. So the, the whole premise of today is that in his book, The Digital Scholar, How Technology is Transforming Scholarly Practice, Martin Weller discusses the changing practices that are occurring and the potential of these digital network open approaches to learning. I think the, the, the piece that seems to be missing very um, often is the context with which this is taking place. Weller, like hundreds of other people, have made a very compelling case for the future of scholarship to be digital, networked, and open. And this case is made over and over and over again in blog posts and research articles and tweets and, and you, know, you know how many different ways we can now broadcast information. And all of us in this room are quite aware that this is a period of transition, as significant as any other in our history. But it's also a period that holds tension and many paradoxes. It's both business as usual and yet a time of major transformation. Individual scholars are being highly innovative and reluctant. And so what I, all of us, I think, after the sessions and the keynotes that we've heard so far, are going back to our classrooms with many ideas for doing things maybe a little bit differently or for doing things that we've never done before. But while we've heard uh, over and over and over again that the internet has changed the structural patterns of work, play, social life, far more than the structural patterns of education, and I think we all know that the reaction of education uh, technologies to MOOCs and flexible classrooms they're under a microscope, a periscope, and a telescope all at the same time. The world is watching to see what higher education is going to be doing with all of these new technologies and the affordances that they allow. However, I think I'm going to tell you what I, I hope is going to be the main point that we take away, and that is that business models inherent in these new web product, products 
threaten to reshape our educational systems in ways that are perhaps not consistent with learning. And so the same way that they allow us to personalize learning and to make it active and participatory in ways that were never before possible, they also make it possible to disrupt everything that we know and hold through about learning. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about ET MOOC. So ET MOOC was a course that was not attached to any particular institution nor any type of institution. In what might be called its innovative nature, it existed across platforms, across institutions, across multiple types of contexts. And those of us who planned and facilitated it, as with the rest of the participants, were from, very, were from various places and had various types of positions. This course was actually led by Alec Kuros, who is a professor at the, at the University of Regina. I hope I got that right. And he, is, um, he has 30,000 followers on Twitter. So this was Alex's brainchild. He sent out a tweet. He said, anybody wants to join me in creating a MOOC? Some of us crazies said yes. And we actually had, we did all of this planning using Google Hangouts, Google Docs. We, we did not use any formal structured um, learning management system or anything that is available on, on the internet that's not for free, except for Blackboard Collaborate, which was what we used for our web, uh, the web uh, conferencing that was done in the course. So what did that look like? So as of last night, there were 17,031 um, tweets that had been sent by people using the at ETMOOC hashtag, and the course is long over. There were 905 people in the Google Plus community. There were 2,799 posts from 511 ETMOOCers. And this is a, dig a digital re a representation of the uh, network interactions that took place. And some uh, technology whiz is actually showing you all of the people that are actively participating in this course. And this was at the height of its participation. So what that really meant is that I would go from order and well-defined structure during the day to an open range with loose stock at night. And, and actually, it, it, that, that was really the heart of what this was all about. If you look at the feedback from the, um, from the courses that I was teaching during the day, you know, I say it because it was so, it was fabulous, right? Best learning situation, great questions, wonderful interactions. And if you look at the feedback from the people who stuck with ET MOOC and who were participating, it was the same. Okay, the number one thing though that everybody talked about to the facilitators in ET MOOC, or we called her, ourselves all kinds of different words as we went through the process was, was the care, the consideration that we had, the motivation that we, pro that we provided. That was what all of the feedback was about. So what's the relationship between these two? For those of you who are on Facebook, I would have to say that it's very complicated. For me, it's actually, in, uh, as you can imagine, I have many credentials from various <laughs> higher education institutions. It was a time, it was perhaps the greatest time of disjuncture. And one of the theories of learning that say, say that the best learning that goes on happens when you actually are at a period of disjuncture. If you are agreeing with everything that you're being told and that's being taught, then you're actually, there's not very much learning going on because all you're doing is actually um, validating what you already know. So that was, became very interesting for me. I literally would feel as I, ET MOOC was a volunteer experience. It was not part of, of anything that I was doing at the college. And as I was driving down the Don Valley Parkway every evening, I'd actually be preparing to morph um, because I, I, I really, would seriously consider this question. How do we teach and learn using tools with which and ways in which we did not learn how to learn? That actually became the question that I would think about every single night as I drove down. 
you know, I had no idea who was out there. I had no idea who was going to participate. I had no idea. I, oft, I would worry. If anybody knows you, you'll know that I am a super worrier. I would worry about all these people that had registered for this course and we'd never heard from them. And one of the things that we stress to people is you could sign up for this course. We will not bug you. Right? You will participate as much or as little as you would like. But I used to like think about where are all these people? Because there were about our first Blackboard Collaborate had just over 200 people participating. And then it quickly uh, went to between 40 and 80. And if I had to give a number, I would say active participation was about 40 people at the end of it, which fits very well with all the stats that you've seen for MOOCs. Now, that's not to say that those other people weren't learning, right? They might have been introverted with their learning rather than extroverted with their learning and the participation. But I, I think this is, is, is perhaps the question. And this brings me to three major things that I, I want to talk about. And the first is the paradox of choice. Has anybody read this book? So what this book, this actual book is, is on one of the, um, is one of the hundred uh, books that you must read before you die, you know, that global mail list that comes out all the time. And actually Dan Lang, who was, who was uh, my, the supervisor of my dissertation, he made, that, made, made me read that book halfway through when it, it was looking as if the dissertation would end up to be 2,000 pages. And he said to me, I want you to not do anything else until you're finished reading that book. Okay, so I went home and I read the book, and the really, the message of that book is when we have too much choice, which is what I had at that stage, I had endless access to information, right? I could speak to all the people at the university that I, that I wanted to. When you have too much choice, it actually makes your life more complex. So the more choice that we have for teaching and learning is actually the more complex that task becomes and not the easier that it becomes, which seems to be what we're hearing, right? We have all these tools available to us, so it should be a lot easier. I also want to think, ask you to consider this question. What do we know about learning? Actually, those are two questions. What do we know about learning? What do you think is the single most determinant of learning? It doesn't matter if you're a behaviorist, a constructivist, a connectivist or a cognitist, what do you think is the most, one of the most um, major facets of learning? Pardon? Motivation, yeah, and what's the other one? I should have asked for two. Motivation and? Well, motivation, desire, I think it's the same thing. It's actually, I'm gonna go through this because, pardon? Need, yeah, all of those are, are very important, but actually, if you really look at the literature, it says prior knowledge, right? Prior knowledge really determines how much you can know, right? If you, it depends, we can only scaffold and build as, as faculty members, as educators, as whoever we are in whatever learning space. So think about what's happened to our learners. I actually believe that the most um, fundamental shift is not technology, even though I believe that technology has got a major role to do its part of everything that I breathe, is the fact that we've moved from elite to mass higher education. And that is actually what is, is where the transformational shift is, almost as much as it is with, um, with technology. What happened when I went to university? Everybody in the class was the same, right? We had the same prior knowledge. We were all there except for maybe one or two oddballs straight out of, higher, of, higher, of um, high school. And I was an international student, or in those days they used to call us foreign students, right? But really and truly, we were all starting out with the same prior knowledge, okay? And I think that piece has been missed from the discussions. The other thing that was really important at that time is the, the fact that our classrooms were the same, okay? And I know there's a lot of, of um, we've taken a, it, you know, higher education has been battered about the sameness, but sameness provided structure. Structure made it easy for us to learn. 
Okay, and now all of a sudden, every learning situation is different. One of the things I tell, uh, we talk about in the faculty development program is remember, each of these students now have five different bosses, okay? Because I come from a college situation where we're preparing for, the jo for jobs, right? But you all of a sudden have five different bosses using five different ways of, of delivering that learning. Okay, some of us are using the course management systems, we're tweeting, we're blogging. So think about what that does for learning. And, and I think that's a very important point that we do not pay enough attention to. You know, to go back to a very traditional, we should be doing pretest. Before we even begin, we should do a pretest of what is it that our the learners in our class, where are they coming from? What's the prior knowledge that we're working on? Especially those of us who teach in the first semester um, foundational courses. So what is How Learning Works? This is one of my favorite books, and there's a quote in the book that says, learning results from what the student does and thinks, and only from what the student does and thinks. This is the first, last time I promised that I'll do par, 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 karaoke. The teacher can advance learning only by influencing what the student does and thinks. There is no place in here that says the teacher can advance learning by the content that it, he or she provides. Okay, so I want you to think about that. I also want you to think about the power of affordance, right? The design of something actually determines what you can do about it, with it, right? The design is actually one of the things that determines more than anything else what you can do with the space. How many people in here consider that you teach in an open classroom? Well, this is even more, um, I actually think, how many people in here teach? Well, I hate to tell you, but we all are teaching in open classrooms. Even if they are bounded by walls, we are now teaching in an open classroom. Right? If I asked all of you, who is the president of Guyana? How many people know who the president of Guyana is? No, but it might get you a prize. <laughs> okay, what do you need to do? You just need to whip out that cell phone. How many people in here have a cell phone? How many people would feel no problem giving the cell phone to the person next to them? I'm telling them they could keep it until the end. Not so many. I see one lone wolf here. <laughs> okay, I digress a little bit there. But, but the thing is, is that our classrooms, even though we might think that to be in an open classroom, we have to be in an open space online, I think, that, and I think that fundamentally that's the point that we're missing. Okay, all of us now teach in open classrooms. All of us teach in classrooms that we could use the potential of what the web has to offer. And I want to think about the affordance of this setup. What did this, what did this space make me feel like if I had to do? It, it made me feel like if I had to, and I, and I think Patrick wanted me to stand up here and give you a, a lecture, right? However, what would have happened if I, we'd come into a room and there was just tables and there were actually some nice cushions on the floor? And we were just going to have a conversation instead of a lecture. And I think a whole lot of what's gone on in the last little while, which is our focus from teaching to learning, and the focus of from a guide on the side to a stage on the stage, whatever, which is a, is a debate that I've actually never bought into, has got nothing to do other than with the affordance of the walls of our classroom. Okay. Because I think what it is, is that this structure of four walls and chairs that face us, those are our only options. We can either be a guide on the side, or we could walk to the side here and be a sage on the stage. And how many people have ever gone into a classroom and say, okay, learners, the learning is all going to be yours. I'm going to guide you. 
okay? And what do they do? They file out. This is not what we want. We want someone who's going to give us the goods, and let's move on, okay? So I want you to also think about that. The design in our, of our spaces, not the technology, not what we know about learning, just simply the design of our spaces. And what happens in an internet minute? So these are the three things. This is the third one. What happens in an internet minute? There was a big debate over, I think it was like the president of Google and someone else the other day got into an, a little bit of an argument over what happens in an internet minute and how much information is being produced. This is, I think, way more important. Okay, I'm sure all of you have seen this slide. It's been used over and over again. But this question was posted on Reddit, and it said, you know, what would it happen? And it's true. So what's that done to content? What do you think that this has done to content? Okay, basically, this is what happens. This is what happens. And you know, I hate to say, but a lot of what we've heard is, and we continue to hear, is all about content, right? We're harnessing the power of the internet to deliver content, right? That's, that's what we're focused on, all of us, right? College and universities are built on order. We're built on the rules of paper. And paper says, one page comes after the next page, which comes after the next page. That's the pedagogy. We're actually teaching using the pedagogy of paper. What if we use the pedagogy of a device, of any device? It doesn't matter if it's an Android, an Apple, a Blackberry, uh, you know, Nexus tablet, uh, Dell. It doesn't matter. What would be, what would happen to pedagogy if we actually considered it from the, from the, except from a paper to a, from a computer screen, where every click, every word can be clicked on and linked to. What does that do to our learning? What do we think about networked, right? Networked equals connection, and it also means disconnection. In ET MOOC, I was connected to 2,000 people. I was one of the main moderators. I tweeted from the ET MOOC. Um, Twitter handle, but it also meant that I was also disconnected. In my 25 student classroom, I was connected to every single one of those people. Okay, I was also disconnected. So it's it's not it's it's really not the the the, the sort of on the line stuff is the same. It's the expanse that's made it different. What does open and global means, right? Open classrooms mean the global connections. We heard on that CBC documentary that almost drove me crazy. Thanks to Patrick, he tweeted it, and I clicked on it at like 11 o'clock at night, and I almost self-combusted or turned into a big hive. Okay, as they talked about global reach, that was all MOOCs were going to be doing to transfer education, is global reach of content. We listened to professor after professor talk about all of a sudden they had a global stage for their content. To let people have information. Yet the most powerful part of the internet and the connections that are digital is the fact that we could have communication and collaboration with people in different countries, in different spaces, in different places. So this, I think, is what's happened. Learning, the order and the structure of learning has just been replaced by chaos. Okay, this is fundamentally what I think is the biggest disaster. This quote, taken from Marshall McLuhan in 1960, looks as if he wrote it yesterday. This challenge, and he was talking about the advent of television, has destroyed the monopoly of the book as a teaching aid and cracked the walls of the classroom, so we are all baffled. Okay? And I think this is true for every single one of us, is we're, we, we're not sure. We're constantly looking for someone to tell us that we're doing the right thing. We're constantly looking for one size that fits all. 
and that is what's changed. Interesting, this quote from Dou Dou Douglas Thomas and John Seeley Brown, and I'm going to leave you to read that. I'm just going to give you two seconds to read that. This is what I think. This is what the new culture of learning is all about. It's the two pieces, right? It's the fact that just as much, if we spent as much time, and I go around the college on my little soapbox and nobody listens to me, but if we spent as much time and investment on creating an online course as we did to create a face-to-face -face course that's happening on our campuses, we would actually transform higher education. If we had uh, videographers and instructional designers and people giving course releases to redevelop their face-to-face -face courses using the affordances of new technologies, we would transform education. Because learning is primarily social. It's a function of the individual, but it's also a function in, of the crowd. And just as much as digital and open and networked gives as many possibilities, we could do digital and open and network right on our campuses. But first, we have to change from content to collaboration and problem solving. We have to change our classrooms as a way for us to package and give content to a place and a space for us to communicate and collaborate. And it doesn't matter if the learning is flexible or moot. Until we do that, that's not going to happen. But that is very difficult to do. So there's no question. I'm sure we all know this change priorities ahead. But this, I actually, I think, is much more um, indicative of what's going on right now. We're panicked, right? We see Harvard and Stanford do something, and we just jump on the bang run. We're just like those people in the video that we started out. We're walking along and we see someone standing in front of that mirror and transforming into a baby and we all do it. Okay, and then we go into this, to the colleges and universities and we say, can we try this? We're jumping off the deep end. It's happening so fast. It's the structures that we've held in place for centuries is changing every minute. Look at what's happening in an internet minute. In this brave new world of MOOCs, you can't really read this. This is a screenshot from the, on the CBC website. And it says, uh, it says here that they are changing the way teachers teach and the way students learn because now we can fill a classroom with a billion brains. OK, this is what the, uh, actually the whatever he, I can't even remember his name. This is what he said over and over and over again in this documentary. All of a sudden, we can fill a classroom with a billion brains, and so learning is going to be transformed. That was his message. This is an internet meme or mem, OK? It is nothing to do with generation, all right? It's got to do with context. Um, our, our great friend uh, Pinsky in 2001, wrote a directive that talked about our classrooms being transformed by digital immigrants and digital natives. We were deep into uh, mass higher education, was really just starting to take root in our classrooms. And so we didn't know what to do with students that were all coming with us with different prior knowledge. And so we decided, yes, this sounds really good. We can hold uh, uh, academics, all of us in here. We like to have labels. So let's call them digital natives and digital immigrants. And that actually gives us a reason why we're having trouble connecting. OK, I don't believe this exists. They are certainly not in my classrooms. This is what happened. Connected learning is, I think, what has happened. OK, and what it calls for is a shift from the traditional. But it's actually more like turning everything upside it down. That's what it's calling for. OK? So we have to rethink learning. And when I say this, I don't mean that I don't believe that the internet's changing our brains. I actually don't buy into that any either. 
I believe I would have been, if I, if I was uh, one of these learners that, you know, find it very difficult to concentrate when I was in grade five and grade six, and I still find it very difficult to concentrate, and it's got nothing to do with the internet. When I grew up in Guyana, we didn't even have TV. Okay. <laughs> However, the distractions now, though, are more. Number one, we are no longer the gatekeepers, right? We no longer hold the information. If you go to the doctor tomorrow and you get a diagnosis, what's the first thing you're going to do? Be honest. You're going to Google it. And you're going to believe all the things that people that you do not know have written, and you're not going to believe the doctor. You're going to go for a second opinion. Right? So what do you think that's done to us? We are no longer the authorities. That's hard. We have to be curators. We have to think about ourselves as curators. We have to go from content keepers to content creators. My first online courses had 4,000 links. Now they have four. Okay, what's the most important information that I could give these students and nothing more? Because they can find all the rest of it on their own. If you look at what I used to do towards what I do, OK? This is the thing that we have to also somehow resolve ourselves to be. Everything we do can be instantly shared, easily copied, easily edited, and viewed by millions. Howard Reingold, who has written the book on NetSmart, this is what he says are the five literacies. Participation, collaboration, network awareness, critical consumption of information, and attention. How is that any different from when I was at school? Except for the network awareness. How has that changed? This was my representation. I listened to a talk from him. This was my representation. And this was the representation of someone else in the room. So what do you guys say? What's the difference from what we got out of that? Our learning styles. And I don't like learning styles. It's just the way that we actually process the information. This says the same thing as the previous slide. What does the research say? Well, it depends on who you ask, especially today. We need to take word from Henry Ford. If people had asked what they wanted, they would have said faster horses, right? So we have to be really cognizant of that. We also have to be aware of our filter bubbles. Does anybody know what a filter bubble is? I, I, just because I'm getting the time here. Um, I'll tell you what a filter bubble is. After I Google 14 things, Google actually directs everything that I, I get from there on. Read about it on Wikipedia. It's got a really great example. And I think we have to be really careful of the danger of a single story about learning. This is another excellent TED Talk. And it talks about our lives are composed of overlapping so stories. And it warns us that if we hear a single story, and that's what we tend to be doing. We tend to be jumping on one bandwagon after the next. The single stories from the people that have the most power to broadcast. OK? We have to adapt to our envi environment. We have to think about the chameleon, because the chameleon does not just adapt to the environment. Can you tell my roots are in biology? It, they, it adapts to the, to the um, heat of the environment. It adapts to the content, context of its environment. And that's the difference. So where do we go from here? I asked everybody to experiment with some of the communication tools, not the content tools, OK? Not creating these nice little packages of content with, with assignments linked to them, because that's the only way that the students are going to participate in our classes, is if we, if we, put, uh, if we attached a, a grade. We have got to change, like Graham talked a little bit about yesterday, right? What does it mean to learn? It doesn't mean content. We got to think about Gumby. Anybody in here knew Gumby? OK, you could have, right, all the time. And I think that's what we have to do. That's what our role of teachers has become. It's become very complex. David Weinberger has read a really great book, and it says, in a world in which information has become too big to know, the expert in the room is the room. And I actually truly believe this. I'm sure anybody sitting there could have come down here and did a keynote. 
right? I heard a really great statement at a presentation I was at the other day, and the guy says, I have no power. I have no point. I'm actually showing you some slides. I'm not using a PowerPoint. <laughs> okay. We have to develop personal learning networks, and Twitter is my number one tool for that today, but tomorrow something might change with that. Right? Well, we have to develop personal learning networks. We have to think about a parachute. We are going to free fall. I think over the next little while, there will be a lot of free falling. Education that acknowledges the full impact of networks and digital media has to recognize a whole new way of thinking and learning. And I want to emphasize that's not a whole new way of delivering content. The open scholar. The open scholar is one who makes their intellectual processes digitally visible. Think about how difficult this is. Think about how if everything that we believe in and say and do, we, we now put out there and let other people attack and change and do their own things for with. Right? But this is what open means. And it does not mean that I teach it, I'm lecturing to you. The hardest part of this keynote is the fact that I knew it was going to be digitally streamed. Uh, you know, I thought, oh, yet I'm in this room. So this is actually an open keynote, right, in a bounded classroom. And I think we have to be careful about what Marshall told us more than we did in 1960. We're shaping our tools and our tools are going to shape us. If we jump on the MOOC bandwagon, that's what higher education is going to look like. Why don't we try to think about how can we make the learning spaces at our institutions more collaborative, more open, and more networked? And this is the hard part, is that there are no prescriptions. One size fits all no longer exists, OK? So I challenge you to change the way of the affordance of the design of our spaces, what, the, what affordance is actually wiring our brains to think about our spaces. That's what I urge you to think about. Instead of thinking of, um, your, of a course as a way to deliver content, forget flexible classroom. Think about it as a way to problem solve. Think about. We have 12 weeks as a semester, sometimes bounded by time and space, and sometimes not. But what we really want to do is actually have it as a container of learning and not a container for content. So if you were hoping from some eliminating way on how to go forward, <laughs> this actually is very clearly a picture of what's going on in my brain at any one period of time during the day. <laughs> okay. So this is what I'm going to leave you. There's a hot debate on uh, um, of who this should be uh, attributed to, but what we have to do is we have to we have to learn, we have to unlearn, and then we have to relearn. That's actually what technology has done. Okay, we have to learn about ways and places and spaces of doing things. Then we have to unlearn that, and then we have to relearn. And it's a constant, uh, it's a constant uh, sort of, I don't even know what to say, whirlpool. Okay, it's not a nice flowing stream. So that is what I hope we will take away from here, is we're not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We're not going to just stop doing and thinking and, and you know, there, I have classrooms. My, my actual best, uh, best learning experience is sometimes when I just sit and listen to someone who knows a whole lot more than me, okay, and has actually filtered and curated that information and is, is passing it on to me. Could I do that every day for, you know, three hours a week for 14 weeks of a semester? I don't think so anymore. Okay, so we have to find the balance, and I think that's the message. For us to find the balance, the potential grounded in, the, in, in traditional ways of learning, right, of knowing, not particularly traditional ways of doing. 
one of my one of my the graphic design students actually did this for me a few years ago as a going away. It was this little thing, you know. I love my computer because my friends are in it. <laughs> okay, I think that's become true for for all of us. Thank you very much. So we have time for comments or question for questions for Valerie. Yes. Laurie. Oh, I think that was my message, right? It's all about balance. And I don't want you to take away from this talk things about MOOCs, okay? We got a lot, about, we got a lot of that. Okay, what I want you to take away is that we can't just use a something in higher education because of the business model. Okay, we have to ground it in learning. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? Yes. No, no, no. I that was just I said instead of giving them, I could I used to full, fill my my courses with links to information, because I had that potential. What I tried to do is I tried to use the power of four. They're not going to read more than actual one, so I'm going to give them four. And hopefully in those four, they'll find one, right? Because if you looked at my courses from five years ago, I would open up folder for week one, even if I was teaching fully face-to-face, -face, and there'd be 4,000 links, right? Because there's so many people with such good information there. But I, so that was what I was doing. I was gate, still thinking of myself as gatekeeper, right? If I didn't give, find this information for you, you couldn't find it yourself. Now I'm thinking of myself as curator. 
what is the very best, what, what do I consider to be the key points? And the open digital spaces of the internet will allow them to find stuff that, you know, doesn't agree or agree. And I'm hoping for the day when one of them will come in and say, well, I read this in your course link, but I found this on the internet and it doesn't connect. And then I think I would have succeeded. Yes. Well, again, I, I use the, the sort of caveat of balance. I tell, and when I'm, I'm teaching, I, I actually teach a course called Digital Trends and Culture. I cannot ask everybody to leave their cell phone at the door, and I wouldn't want to, because I don't want anybody to take away my cell phone from me. Okay, if, if, if Patrick had said, you have to do this keynote, and you can't have your cell phone, even though it's tucked away in my bag and it's turned off, I would have gone, oh, what if I needed it, right? So, but what I do say to them is cell phones are allowed in here. If I find that you're way more interested in what you are doing on your cell phone than I am doing at any point in time, then I'll ask you to share that with the class, and I do. And after the first couple of times I do that, um, people actually think twice before they break out in laughter at whatever YouTube clip they're looking at while, while we're teaching. I also, um, I, I, I don't, I think if we come to the point in having to manage the behavior of the, the cell phone in our class, we've gone too far. I think what we actually need to do is to go back to something that's very traditional and have learning contracts. I actually have a learning contract that I, we talk about in the first week of, day of class. Would you like me to be texting and answering my cell phone when I was teaching you? What do you think that would be? I've never had anybody say anything other than that would be rude and not respectful of them and nobody would have ever said to me yet and it might come. So I'll deal with that when that happens. So I think we actually have to Set ground rules for our spaces of learning. There's nothing wrong with that, right? There are going to be times in here where I'm going to ask you to fully focus, but it's not going to be for 90 minutes, right? I, I use that rule of break up every 20 minutes, and I actually started out doing it with a timer, and the timer would actually go off after 20 minutes because I could speak for days, okay, on anything, <laughs> as long as I have been able to do some research on Google before. Right? So, so I actually try to make sure that I'm not standing there. It goes back to Laurie's question, if that, that little point about if I can be replaced by their cell phones, then I have to think about what's going on in the class. Alec Kouros teach, uh, tweeted something a couple of nights ago, and he said, if I, one more person asks me if there should be marks for participation, he said, if, I, if, you're, if learning is not participatory and active, it is not learning. Right? That's a big shift for us. It might not seem so, but it is. What's my first, my very first, in, uh, you know, when I walk into a classroom, I've got way more information in my head that you have in yours. And I've got to share that with you. And that's really not the case so much anymore. But it is the case in sometimes, right? Uh, I mean, we're, we're also hired for our expertise. Right? We're not hired just because we have 40,000 followers on Twitter, I don't think yet, anyway. Actually, sometimes that might be go against us. So I think it's balance, but I also think it's time, it should always have been that way, is that there are certain rules of this classroom, be it online or face-to-face. -face. If I'm teaching a fully online course, here's the learning contract, right? Here are things you're going to protect your private information. You know, there are things that you are, will not stay, say in any blog or Twitter feed or anything that has this course's hashtag. So I think we have to, we have to balance. I hope that answered your question. Well, I'd like to thank Valerie for a very insightful talk. I want to keep us on track on time. And we're, uh, we're fast tracking things uh, because of